Hi, welcome to Stalwarts of Music with Aditya Vira, Season 3. I'd like to give a special shout out to my podcast partner, Perpetual Buzz Experiences. You can feel free to check them out on www.perpetualbuzz.com. 2023 was such an incredible year with several noteworthy highlights. The podcast won the Hub Hopper Podcast Award for Best Interview Podcast of 2023. And ever since, we've had several many live podcast formats at noteworthy occasions like the NCPA International Jazz Festival, the Snarky Puppy India Tour, and Steve Weiss India Tour of 2023. So I'd like to show you all a little sneak peek of what happened in 2023. This is Paul Gilbert. Hello, everybody. This is Urbain Chatterjee. I'm Ludovico Inaudi. I'm. Hi, this is Antonio Sanchez. In India, this is Jordan Rudis from the. And this is Adrian Vandenberg. Today, Study Sykes. This. Hey, this is, this is Rhonda Smith. Hi, I'm Harold Faltermeyer. This is Dave Weckley. Hi, this is Bill Frizzell. Hey, this is Judah and You're watching Stewards of Music with Aditya Vira. You're listening to Stalwarts of Music with Aditya Vira. You're listening to Stalwarts of Music with Aditya Vera. And you're listening to Stalwarts of Music with Aditya Vera. And you're listening to Stalwarts of Music with Aditya Vera. Hello, India. Hello, Bharat. I will be talking to Aditya Vera for his series Stalwarts of Music with Aditya Vera. Good to know I that. Did. Yeah, it's, it's, it's by far one of the most intelligent interviews. An interesting, an interesting choice of questions. Uh, very well presented. I like where you're coming from and your your uh, your questions and you've done your research and your. It was a pleasure to discuss uh, all the, those uh, great topics uh, yeah. that yeah. you. Um, you, you put on the table and uh, I was lucky to be with you in this hour. I spent a beautiful hour with you. Thank you. Very nice interview. I am very happy that your questions were very, very nice. And uh, even you are so young, you have the depth and uh, you have uh, the knowledge. So I congratulate you. He is connecting people from this side of the globe to the other side of the globe. He's doing an amazing job. I would kindly request that you all check out Aditya Vera on his Instagram and his YouTube channel. His Instagram, I think, is A D I X seven zero seven zero. So give it up for Aditya Vera, everyone. Go check it out. Season three, twenty twenty four, seems quite promising already, and I'm bringing to you the best of artists in every possible genre on this planet. The Mahindra Blues Festival is marking its 12th year and it returns on the 10th and 11th of February 2024 at Mumbai's Mehboob Studio. As a pivotal part of Asia's blues scene and India's blues movement, the festival has been a platform for both global and homegrown blues talent. Mahindra's consistent support for arts and culture is evident through its 11-year commitment providing an unparalleled blues experience in Mumbai. 
The festival has hosted legends like Buddy Guy, John Mayall, and the Taj Mahal. I'm delighted to inform you all that Stalwarts of Music with Aditya Veera is partnering with Hyperlink Brand Solutions for a -a one-of-a-kind music festival edition podcast featuring three incredible artists, Dana Fuchs, Vanessa Collier, and Samantha Fish. The episodes will be out respectively on the 21st, 28th of January and the 4th of February, exclusively on my YouTube channel, Aditya Veera 1994. Don't forget to subscribe if you haven't already. And be sure to get your tickets for the Mahindra Blues Festival happening on the 10th and 11th of February. And the ticket links are right in the description. The National Center of Performing Arts in Mumbai announces the fifth edition of the Mumbai dance season, starting from the 18th of January to the 4th of February 2024. This 18-day cultural celebration features 27 events showcasing over 100 classical dancers. The initiative aims to unite various Indian classical dance forms through performances, lecture demonstrations, workshops, and masterclasses. Events will take place across Mumbai, Greater Mumbai, and Navi Mumbai. It's being co-curated by noteworthy artists such as Jayashree Nair and Lata Rajesh. The season will offer a diverse range of performances including choreography based on Tamil literature and a Kathak tribute to Pandit Briju Maharaj. Additionally, activities include symposiums, book exhibitions, classical dance, poetry evenings and many more. So be sure to grab your tickets on the official NCPA website. Speaking of my guest today, she is none other than Dana Fuchs. She's a powerful figure in contemporary roots music and she has seamlessly fused soul and blues music. She's drawn inspiration from her small town roots in Wildwood, Florida. Her music reflects a narrative of triumph over family struggles showcased in albums like Bliss Avenue and Love Lives On. In her latest project, Borrowed Time, Fuchs pays homage to her southern rock upbringing, delivering universal stories inspired by real-world events. Navigating a diverse musical landscape, Fuchs has raised in a consecutive town, found solace in music, blending these influences of the Deep South with classic rock legends. So without any further ado, I'm delighted to welcome my guest for today, Dana Fuchs. Hi, I'm Dana Fuchs, and you're listening to Stalwarts of Music with Aditya Vera. <laughs> Hi, Dana. Namaste. Welcome to Stalwarts of Music with Aditya Vera Season 3. It's such an incredible privilege to have you on the show. Hello. It's such a great privilege to be here on the show. Thank you. I'm very excited about all of this and returning to Mumbai, so Mahindra. Well, uh, this is the first time uh, Mahindra Blues is having a festival edition podcast. Uh, so I've collaborated with them on this effort. So I'm, I'm so happy that uh, it all fell in place and we we're able to do this. Wonderful. So I am very excited to be talking to you today. I have a couple of very, very interesting questions uh, for you today. But before we get started, uh, where are you at? And I see a couple of interesting pictures right behind you. This is my home haven. Um, okay. I'm a Buddhist. This is part of my shrine, and uh, it's okay. my home office, studio. Mm-hmm. I do it all here. It's my music, my meditation, everything. Marvelous, marvelous. And uh, where are you at right now? I live in Harlem, Harlem, New York City. Oh, incredible, incredible. And what does your day look like? What are you up to today? Well, the day started, as usual, with my children, and then I was able to do a nice long meditation retreat. January is retreat month for the Buddhist uh, lineage I belong to, so I've been in heavy retreat in the mornings and evenings, which has just been lovely. And then it's off with the kids. Um, Okay. Yeah. Incredible. Uh, So coming to our agenda, I'd like to start with our uh, itinerary for today. So, uh, Dana, could you tell me about your journey towards becoming a professional musician? What was it like? Oh, 
you know, it's kind of one of those things that you just know as a child. Like I, I was the youngest of six kids. So music was always playing in our house. And I, I just remember knowing mm-hmm. at a very young age, music is, is my life. I've got to find a way to make music my life. And, you know, by the time I was 16, okay. I took over this small town band and I was singing on weekends um, in these clubs. At first, I pretended to be older, and then they found out I was underage, but my parents signed a permission slip to let me continue and keep the job. So it was my first real paying job, and I would sing at this club every Thursday, Friday, Saturday night. It was it was wonderful, but I also sort of lost my childhood, my teenage years at that point, because now I'm not hanging out with my friends on weekends. I'm actually hanging out with their parents, which was a little odd, and performing for them. So... Um, and then shortly after that, I was barely 19 when I just knew I had to get out of this small town in Florida I was in. And I made my way to New York City. Um, I just happened to make a friend who was moving back to New York with her mom. And I just said, can I catch a ride with you? And two days later, I left with really no notice and right. no plan. And found my way into the city, auditioning all the time. And that's sort of when I discovered the whole blues scene that was happening in New York. And honestly... I knew pretty much every genre of music in my family, but somehow we didn't know that much about blues, the old R&B, the old soul, the old classic rock. But um, so I was really new to the blues and and went into this club. I had just moved to this little neighborhood, the Lower East Side of uh, Manhattan. And I was told about a club. I walked in and my now music partner was on stage ripping this guitar solo with this big black Cherokee Indian man singing like a voice I'd never heard before. And I, I was just like, what is this? And that was it. <laughs> Incredible. So has it always been a smooth uh, journey? Like I'm sure, you know, as a musician, you would have encountered several many obstacles. Uh, could you speak a little bit about that? It's a life fraught with obstacles, but yeah. I mean, what isn't really, if you have a dream and a passion, I think for anything you, you get, through the hurdles and obstacles. I think for me, it was just really, um, you know, finding my footing, especially I was very drawn to that soul, that old blues. And, you know, it was, it was a world of music where it was more male dominated. um, And it wasn't really open to, you know, white interpretation as much, I think. Um, and, you know, it, it took a while to convince clubs to give me a gig. Yeah. yeah. Um, and and once they did, it sort of took off like wildfire. But then I, I was faced with, this is not my story. These are not my songs. I'm singing about Tobacco Road. I don't, I didn't live this experience. Yeah. Um, and also, based on that, I wanted to write my own story, you know, and in the pain and hardship I had. I, I'm not a happy songwriter. I mean, I'm a happy person, but yeah, my songs yeah. aren't happy. Yeah, yeah. They're redemptive. I like to believe that, you know, it's, we take that dark human story that we all have mm-hmm. and we celebrate together through music and that's the redemptive part. So I think for me, you know, the next hurdle was what do I have to say? And I remember watching this documentary with Bob Dylan and he's like, you're not an artist unless you have something to say. He was so pointed about it. And I was like, I better find out what the heck I have to say. And so then it was writing my own songs and going more in a rock and roll direction, veering away from the blues. And then the hurdle that was for many years after that I faced was, you know, labels didn't know they, they want to put you in a box. Well, is she blues? Is she rock? Is she soul? And I didn't want to be one thing i was drawing on old school country i was drawing on soul and r&b i was drawing on blues i was drawing on classic rock but then i was putting my own voice into it so that was the the longest and most frustrating i think hurdle for me to go through in this trajectory of my music career like why do i have to be labeled can i just make music yeah Uh, that's a short <laughs> yeah, 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 yeah. But 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 interesting that you mentioned that uh, amidst so many different genres that you were consuming, uh, you did find your own voice, right? So if you had to sort of give like a a little cookbook for uh, for someone who's starting out, how do they find their own voice? 
Well, you have to first see who you gravitate towards. Like what voices, like for me, the deep, rich, soulful voices of Mavis Staples, Esther Phillips, Otis Redding, and then in the rock and roll world, Robert Plant, you know, that was just for voice. And then for songwriting, it was Bob Dylan, Tom Waits, um, Leonard Cohen. And then for performance, it was Mick Jagger, Robert Plant. You know, so you find out who you gravitate towards and you and you take the best, you know, always borrow. My, I, I have a friend who's a professor and she always tells her students, steal from the best. Mm. And then once you really have found who you emulate and, and you, you know, build a foundation of using some of the tools, you know, that they've left behind, mm-hmm. then you'll, you'll start to find out who you are in that mix and you'll most likely have that very special recipe of your own yeah. um and and it'll feel good when you perform because you won't feel like you're imitating somebody i played janice joplin off broadway for about a year was always compared to her before the show after doing the show was compared to her forever yeah always been a compliment don't take i mean it's a high high compliment but you know for me it was very important that i didn't do any janice songs at my show i'll cover right. otis thing i'll cover led zeppelin but I never really covered Janis Joplin because I don't want to be a mimic. You don't want to be a mimic. You want to steal from the best and then let your own version of that recipe come in. So take all those ingredients that you like, yeah. all those flavors, all those seasonings, mix them all up and then make your own creation. I agree. Cook- with, yeah. Yeah. I agree with you. In fact, uh, what I've noticed uh, personally as an ardent music admirer, uh, you know, having worked with several many musicians, there is this sort of identity crisis where they are a little clueless as to what direction to take. Uh, some of them like complex music. Uh, say, for instance, there was a band that I was working with as a as a manager, and if I had if I had to go to one of their shows, I would hear a little bit of Hiatus Coyote. I would hear a little bit of Stevie Wonder. I would hear a little bit of Carnatic jazz fusion. There's a lot of identity crisis, you know, as to what direction to take or what path to take. So I completely it's, agree with you on that. It's such a common thing yeah. to go through. And I think it's a necessary yeah. step to have that yeah. identity crisis. Yeah. And, you know, hopefully to find your way out of it. And the only way to find your way out of it is to just keep trying and seeing what yeah. feels right. Sure. You know, I, I've had a lot of friends in in pursuing a career in music who just felt more like it was important to try to keep up with the trend that was happening in music at the time and, and try to have that sound. And I think, you know, and, and none of those musicians ended up sticking with it because they never felt, they never did what felt right to them. They did what they thought yeah. was going to be what people wanted to hear in that moment. And that's just, that's the recipe for, or disaster if we're using the <laughs> cookbook analogy. Well said. Uh, you also did mention briefly about songwriting. So what is it that impels you to write music? What is your muse? Humanity. It's people. It's the people I talk to, the conversations I hear around me, the stories of people that, you know, I read about or hear about. It, it's always been... Yeah. I, 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 Nothing drives me more than humanity. I think in general, but especially when it comes to songwriting and performing, like it's about that connection with people and what makes them tick and what hardships they go through, what they are able to, you know, the resilience human beings have and and the suffering they have is has always driven me for better or for worse. I mean, you can make some I've had people when I first started out, you know, and I would say this song's about this and this song, I stopped doing that as much. People would be a little depressing, you know. So that's why I, I try to, you know, take those stories and make them universal because who doesn't suffer, no matter what your life looks like on paper, but put them in a in a way that we can all relate to and then have hope. Yeah. Because it is hopeful. Sure, sure. I guess it's uh something that we ascribe to. Uh, You know, uh, we expect a lot of songwriters that they'll have some sort of a wounded psych 
that they must have gone through a great deal of pain and the process of writing is the catharsis it's probably uh, you know if if you were to consider it it's a form of expression of venting out the pain and uh, i'm sure as as any human being would go through you must have had some tragic times too so could you speak about how music helped you overcome those situations absolutely i mean it, it was it, it, everything cathartic uh for me my first yeah. album was really dedicated to the suicide of my sister um mm -hmm. the mental illness of my dad and my oldest brother yeah. then passed away tragically i was with him um you know i lost three siblings and both of my parents all young and unexpectedly and that that sort of formed each album and each chapter i went through my own battles mm -hmm. with addiction and um you know despair uh and i had to i had to take life to the very very edge before i was able to say okay no more and honestly it was my sister's death that really was the wake up call uh for me that i had to I had to put it all into music and I had to make it work somehow because she and I had this dream of doing it together. She was significantly older. Um, I was the baby of six. She was the second in command from the top. And, um, you know, when her life just took such a dark turn and, and she ended it at a very young age, I, uh, the shock of that and the grief of that was was also what saved my life because I was heading in that same direction at 19, 20 years old. Mm -hmm. um, so, you know, my first several albums are really all about that personal suffering. And, and then, of course, this, when you talk about that thing on stage, you meet people after the show. I always do a meet and greet and I would hear, oh, I had a similar situation. I lost my sister. Or I lost my brother or my mom or dad, whatever I lost. I've met parents that lost children um, yeah. or I had this addiction or I had this and you talk and then that sort of became morphed into my music and it became less just obviously personal and it became more about people that I've been, you know, have been going through the same thing. So it became more universal. And then, you know, the last album I made was really just some of the songs on it um, are really about stories that are happening out in the world right mm -hmm. now and, and suffering of people I don't know or haven't spoken to, but I've yeah. read about. Or, so it's kind of gone from here to sort of here as far as the storytelling. Um, it's always a personal connection to it, of course. Again, it's what I gravitate toward, um, but it's giving voice to other people who might yeah. not, have a microphone and a stage. Well, definitely, you've you've really come a long way. The music has been compelling. It's it's touched so many hearts. Probably transformed the uh, lives of several many people all across the world. Uh, so now that you are in a much better place, what is the sense of joy that drives you now? What is the source of joy? of living what are the elements of life that give you pleasure now it it you know it's the same thing it's meeting people it's the travel it's my own children it's just connecting i i i'm i'm somebody who my friends tease me like i always need community i love to be around people okay um you know and the road life can be lonely in in some instances in that way especially before i had kids and was dragging them with me um but so, you know, I really, the meet and greet, I loved that part of it. And I loved the days off and going and the promoter would say, well, I'm going to take you to meet these people. Or I'm going to take you to see this site, yeah. you know, just seeing the world for me and, and getting to know other cultures and always connecting with other human beings is, is really my truest sense of joy. And it's what fills my well. Mm -hmm. Incredible. Uh Talking about criticism, how did you generally go about handling criticism which was directed at you? You know, it gets easier when you're out there for a while because you, you develop what they call a thick skin. That's no joke. Um, mm, yeah. You know, and I, as I got older, I just stopped 
reading the good or the bad criticism because you know you you can get really hooked on the good stuff and then when you get the bad stuff it's like oh so I just feel like I'm pretty good at self-evaluating and I know if I did something a show that was not its best or you know if if I'm recording an album I I'm like this, this song is crap it's not ready I can't go there you know I feel like criticism should be coming from yourself not in an unhealthy way you know like a self-evaluation self-assessment um mm -hmm. we know as artists what's good and what isn't as soon as you wait for everybody to give you that uh, validation mm -hmm. some will some won't so if you're depending on that it's it's not going to sustain i think um and of course trusted people and there are times when i've heard things that i didn't like and then i sat with it and it hurt and it was uncomfortable but i went back and i'm like yeah they had a point you know it's being able to take it from trusted sources you know uh and go sit with it and take what you need leave the rest <laughs> you make things sound really simple you know i must say that <laughs> yeah. i don't know maybe it's all the years of being out there but it yeah, yeah. it's kind of come down to common sense it is yeah, yeah for sure uh the intellectual engages in studying music analyzing other songwriters and dabbling in the rigorous processes of the more shall we say empirical studying of creative processes so i'd like to understand your interface between the academic in you and the creative self so from my personal understanding academics are people who fail to be creative in a lot of ways so could you could you throw some light on that it it's very easy to lose sight of the creativity if you're focused strictly on the academic side i i remember when i you know i was self taught on piano many years ago and drums were my first instrument but when it was bogged down to learning some of the theory i i got tripped up on that and mm -hmm. i had to really find a balance of playing for myself i'm not a good piano player by the way i mean okay. but i can accompany myself on a song if i want to yeah. sing and play a song i can pull it off yeah. um yeah. I don't really tend to do it live because it's not a strength for me correct but i had to choose the way i enjoyed playing an instrument same with guitar and you know i had learned piano and i see music theory on a piano keyboard that's how it makes sense to me uh when i started taking guitar lessons I had a teacher that was just, you know, play with the metronome, play with the metronome. I was like, oh, this is not for me. And then I just started playing with a real drummer, raving it on stage and finding that, you know, more organic approach to finding rhythm and my own rhythm. And then, you know, when you want something badly enough, you'll learn the skill behind it. But I think if you just, some people... Uh, can just go straight into the skill in academia and then create later. I'm not one of those people. I have to stay connected to it, which means I stay kind of rudimentary in my guitar playing and my piano playing. Yeah. I'm okay with that. And I wasn't trying to be a virtuoso in that way. I like performing and singing and putting on the show. And I like accompanying myself on certain songs. But I think, you know, it's just important to love the study of it. And if you love the study of it, you'll find a way to create. If you don't love the study of it technically, yeah. then just create it first and learn as you go. Sure thing. Uh in fact, you know any any kind of art for that matter, if you if you don't have a flair for it, if you don't like you said love to love the study of it, right? Like if you don't resonate towards something, it gets really hard to sort of pull it off. Yeah. And you can't it, it, force those kind of things, or you're just not going to yeah. be happy. You're going to enjoy yeah. the experience. Yeah, yeah, totally. Uh, what responsibility do you feel as a songwriter to reflect the truth as you see it around you? That has changed for me a lot recently. Um, you know, my most recent album, Borrowed Time, the opening track is called "Double Down on Wrong," and that's when I realized who knows the real truth. The truth yeah. is just that things, and this is going to sound so childish in a sense and probably way too utopian, but I think if people really sit and think about it, the only truth is that 
kindness and love work better than anything else. And if we understand that someone else's truth yeah. is important to them, even if we find it misguided or we have a different truth, we need to honor the truth of others, not to the degree of justifying heinous acts, but mm. like hearing why people are compelled to vote a certain way or why people are compelled to, you know, feel a certain way about a certain race. We need to understand yeah. why they have that truth to then help unpack it and then maybe find a deeper truth that, you know, can help people let go of their biases yeah. or their hatred or their fear because it, it's always fear so my feeling about now my responsibility is to just kind of hold a space for both sides of the argument and say come on let, you know let's unpack that and I try to do it in my songs double down on wrong is about everybody's side of the story around you know the president elect I have my own personal opinions about the president yeah. that was elected to this country my personal opinion was that he was not qualified, but it's important to find out why people thought he was a better choice and to respect why they thought that and then to help them understand maybe <laughs> it wasn't in their best interest. That's just a one min minor example, but yeah. because this we're in a post-truth world, right? Correct. I mean, Correct. everybody is, is believing in their own truth to a detriment. The humanity and i just hope we can the world can evolve in a way that at some point we can reflect on why we're holding on to these truths at the expense of our own happiness sorry i don't mean to get all <laughs> no but but uh it is quite as you said it is quite important to sort of uh voice your opinions there there has to be this aspect of uh freedom of speech for any any human being to you know uh reflect the truth as it were to be yeah yeah and hopefully you know we can get back to sort of an artful debate because <laughs> that's been lost in the yeah. world it's just all like no screw you i'm right no <laughs> screw you it's me <laughs> you know yeah yeah. Uh, I mean, looking at your wall, uh, it, it gives me of this impression that uh, there is a spiritual element in terms of what you do. Right. So, what is that? Could you could you throw some light on that? Sure. Um, you know, I feel like I was seeking a spiritual component in life. Since I was a child, I was raised Catholic, interestingly enough, but raised in a southern town where there were no Catholic churches. Mm -hmm. um, and I just knew I had to find something bigger than me. There was a lot of tumult and, and pain in our household. So church was sort of an outlet for me, yet I didn't quite believe in this, you know, in the way God was taught, like this higher being that will punish you for this and it that just didn't make a lot of sense to me so i was seeking for a long time and i buddhism made the most sense to me um you know decades ago and for me it's really just about what is our intention what, what are we doing with this life what's my intention when i say this thing to a certain person is my intention to harm or to help and i just feel like with my songwriting, what's my intention? Is it to wallow in, you know, a misery, which my first album did a little bit. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> or is it to connect with other people and hope yeah. hopefully give them a message that other people are going through this, that you're not alone. So I feel like my spirituality is very much driven by the intention to sort of make do something meaningful with this one little life I have. This, you know, I'm just this an insignificant little thing. I don't think I have this holy power in any sense but if my if i get the privilege of being able to be on a stage and travel the world and people coming to a concert they deserve something back for that and that's just my intention like what can i give you thank you for 
giving me this opportunity to have this lifestyle that I always wanted as a kid. I, I got to earn it and you deserve it's, it's, I always say the show is 50, yeah. 50, you know, it's not just me. It's the audience. I, I'm not, I'm nothing without you guys, without festivals, without promoters, the crowds. So so my Buddhist spirituality just seems to work the most with that. Cause it's such a common sense philosophy that I mean, it's just easier with kindness. I just like so simple. Uh, you did mention about your album a couple of times during our conversation. So could you reflect on the origins of the album Lonely for a Lifetime and what did you seek to achieve with it? Lonely for a Lifetime, you mean as far as success-wise or musically? Uh, both. Maybe give me a little bit of both. Yeah. Okay, that's a yeah. good question. I haven't yeah. really ever thought about that in, or maybe not for a long time. Uh, yeah. That was my very first album. I was raw. It was raw. Mm -hmm. Um you know, I was still figuring out like who I was musically, who I was personally. There's a lot of anger. There's mm -hmm. a lot of desperation in that album, which, okay. you know, the, the song strung out. I mean, that's a metaphor of addiction and love, right? Uh, mm -hmm. um, the song Songbird for my sister was just a, 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 just a day in the life of remembering growing up with her. She used to sing me to sleep at night. So there's a lot of raw pain in that first album. And, you know, my heart was so in it. And I thought that like, you know, I had just started doing original shows and I was really selling out these popular venues in New York City and the labels were all coming down. And I had my hopes set. Oh, I was going to get this record deal. They were going to love this album as much as I did. And, you know, that was my first big slap in the face rude awakening of like no you know oh she should be more like cheryl crow who was quite big at the time and, and it was all these people i was supposed to be more like and yeah. it was it was my first real experience of putting it out there and and getting the criticism getting the rejection um but it was also a wonderful learning experience every every bit of that just drove me further into wanting to better myself as a songwriter, better myself as a singer mm -hmm. and better myself as to not needing all of the external validation, which I think as, as an artist, if you want to be a lifer with it, that's the first thing that has to go. <laughs> well, uh, of course, uh, two things are very important like validation and it has to be a blissful journey as a musician or anyone anyone would want to maximize the number of blissful moments in their uh, uh, life right so I, I feel that's that's very essential uh, and and you also did mention about uh, you know how personal it is how deeply personal it is it must have taken you a lot to sort of Put all those lyrics down. Like you, you must have had a heavy heart while writing this particular uh, album. So it must have taken a lot in terms of uh, writing all those thoughts down. It did. You know, the the first three yeah. albums were that way yeah. for me, where yeah. It, yeah. it was almost too much. I was reliving these stories. Yeah, that yeah. yeah. Was, in one level, it was cathartic. Yeah. But it, it wasn't always helping me move on. It was a little bit like, I, you know, you know how you get a song stuck in your head at night and we call it an earworm. I was having these songs with these traumatic stories playing in my head every night because when you're making an album, that's what happens. Yeah. Um, and it was hard. Of course. But uh, you've, you've come out, you've, you've come out writing all this great music and, and you know, making listeners uh, resonate with it in a very beautiful way. So you should uh, feel happy about it. Thank you. I appreciate that. <laughs> yeah. What's your view on the state of the recording music business current currently? Are you happy about how things are? Um, it's never been a, a very nice, <laughs> fair business. Um, but okay. I think there is more opportunity for artists to get their music out there. What I would like to see change is that artist that has a million views on Spotify, but is still broke. 
Um, <laughs> <laughs> speaking personal experience on that one, I think, yeah. you know, I, I wish there was more protection for mm. musicians. I think audiences deserve the music. I wish um, audiences, like, I've been very lucky because my audience is a little older and they're yeah. so respectful. They'll, they'll buy a CD even if they don't have a CD player, you know? Yeah. Um, and just because they know they've already gotten the album for free digitally, they want to support. And I make it a habit to do that too. If I like an artist, yes, Spotify is so amazing. It's so convenient. The artists don't tend to see the money for that. And so I try to support them in ways, going to the concert, buying their merchandise. Um, it's hard to keep up with, you know, I, I would like to see that change, but I do think it's nice that there isn't this monopoly on music the way it was you know, certainly when I was starting out, if you didn't get the record deal, yeah. it was really tough. And that's shifted shortly after I started out, which is the only thanks to YouTube. And I started touring the world and I never had a big label behind me. So I was able to make a living, see the world and not be told that I have to dress a certain way or sing a certain way or write a certain way. So there was so much more freedom of expression. And I think that's been the really beauty of, you know, that monopoly sort of. I mean, it's still there and there are those top, yeah. top, top performing artists. Yeah. It'll always be there, but there's still so much more opportunity for artists to not, you know, feel like, oh, I didn't get the big deal. My music career is over. I'm going to drive a bus forever. Nothing wrong with driving a bus, but that's not what you want to do. You shouldn't have to do it instead of making music. Yeah, intent uh, is, is quite important. Absolutely. Especially after the pandemic, uh, it must have been a little hard to sort of get back in track and uh, recover in terms of the economic perspective. How, how, what was it like for you? Have you have you been able to recover? Slowly but surely starting to pick back up. I mean, there was one, I have to say, you know, there's a lot of frustrating things about <laughs> the world and certainly our government and country over here. but. Um, I was quite fortunate that as a musician to collect this unemployment, you know, I have my own business as a musician yeah. uh, and I was able to get help mm. with the, all of the financial loss of three years of just all of a sudden, shh, no work, nothing. Yeah. Um, that was a little scary. But then when that financial aid came through, I know so many mu musicians, we were like, hallelujah. <laughs> um, <laughs> And, you know, that, again, is where something like Facebook was miraculous because we would do these concerts from our living room and have thousands of people tuning in from all over the world. So we would stay connected in, in, in such a strange time. Yeah. Um, but I think, you know, the world is starting to come back, bounce back. Yeah. But for performers and people in the service industry, that was... I mean, for everybody, it was such a tough time. But there were a lot of silver linings, as we say. I mean, there always are in these things, right? Yeah, certainly. In fact, if, if you were to look at India, and uh, the past few months have been great in terms of music festivals, international artists coming to India, uh, Indian indie artists are, give, uh, are given like ample opportunities. So... It looks like it's heading in the right direction. I can I can speak for on behalf of my country, but I don't know what's going on beyond that. Yeah. It's exciting. I mean, if someone had told me when I was a kid or a teenager, I would be singing in Mumbai, mm -hmm. in, in in India. Yeah. Now twice, I I would have I would have never believed it. What an incredible, it, it, what a gift! And yeah, it's so. There's so much. So much positive yeah. happening in, in the world of music. You, you did mention about the much-awaited Mahindra Blues Festival. Uh, so could you take us through the process of preparing for this festival? I was briefly interacting with your bass player, Kevin, on, yes, on yes. email. So do you have something special planned for the Indian audiences? What's the set list going to be like? I, you know, I am still... This I always have a hard time making set lists and then I have an even harder time sticking with them because I like to see what's happening yeah. with the audience. So my band is prepared to do, you know, the songs that I'm feeling compelled to do. 
I wish I could take a survey in the India audience that knew any of my songs would tell me what they want to hear. <laughs> but mm-hmm. so, if, you know, I'm going and guessing, but I'm going to just do what I'm feeling inspired to do, which I'm still narrowing that down. I, I want, you know, I, I feel so privileged to be able to come there. And I just, I want to, I want to give the audience a, a spectacular experience I don't say show because the audience for me is so part of it. I want them to feel, I just want to have a connection. My goal is to whatever, however long my set is, forget about anything going on in your life that isn't pleasant right now. And let's just celebrate in the name of music. I always used to call it my rock and roll church of love. (laughs) You know, let's just have a good time. We'll sweat, we'll stomp, we'll whatever. Um, So that's what I'm hoping is just like a set that will, go through a journey and hopefully rock out and I can't wait for it I really can't wait for it I'm I'm coming all the way from Bangalore which is down south of India to uh, upwards towards Bombay to watch you live so I'm very very excited oh thank you Did the, how far of a drive is that or is it a flight or a train it is, or... A, it is a flight it is a flight okay. it's pretty far yeah it's uh-huh. a it's a one and a half hour flight Okay. Oh, yeah. So that would be quite a drive. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. How how big is your contingent, and who are the people who will be playing with you? I'll have my keyboard player, bass, drums, guitar. Mm-hmm. You know, the simple unit, and uh, you know, I play guitar on several of the tunes, just acoustic, um, just to okay. fill it out. But that's going to be the lineup. Interesting. And and uh, do you have? Something apart from music that you want to explore in India? Have you uh, thought about it? You know, the last time I was there, I didn't have kids yet. So I really just, I went all through and I mean, I, I wrote a big blog about it. I was just so blown away by everything I saw. Okay. I kind of want to have that experience with my kids again. Just say, let's let's go see a part of the world, a culture, you know, that we we don't see i mean new york city obviously we have a lot of indian people and yeah, you, you yeah. go to certain neighborhoods and get a small taste of it yeah but i kind of want to immerse myself and the kids really just go out i mean that's what i did i walked through the laundry district of mumbai last time i went all through the neighborhoods where the real people live not just the nice hotels like i want to get out and do that again yeah i'd be happy to show you around i'd be happy to show you different cuisines uh, in Mumbai, if you have the time, and uh, maybe uh, also show you a little bit of uh, monuments around there. Yes, yeah. I would uh, love it. Yeah, yeah, I could do that. Yeah, That would be amazing. Yes, I will take you up on that, Aditya. <laughs> yeah, certainly, certainly. Uh, you, you worked with MTV on, on a couple of occasions uh, between the 1990s and the 2000s. So tell me about that experience. What was it like? You know, it, it it was funny. I was doing one of my first shows in in New York City, right okay. by MTV headquarters in in Midtown, and it was two sets that night. And I was taking a break, and these guys called me over and said, "Hey, we really like your voice." And I said, "Thanks." And I thought they were talking about my singing, and they said, "No, your speaking voice. Do you do voiceovers?" And I was like, "What's a voiceover?" Yeah. Well, it's like you come, they don't see you, read a script, but it's not you're you're not on camera. Yeah. It's like, oh, yeah, yeah, I can do that. And then I bugged. He said, okay, we'll bring you in and, and just do a test read. So he gave me his email and I just kept bugging him. I want to come do a test read. I want to try this test read. And so I came in and I read, um, this is your brain. This is your brain on MTV. I'll never forget it. <laughs> and and then I had to do another one where they wanted this sultry voice. MTV, feel the love. <laughs> so it was just a test. I went home and they called me the next day and said, we're going to play your test read on air. You're going to get paid. And okay. we want to start bringing you in every week. So I started doing voiceovers. And then I started writing the yeah. copy yeah. that I was saying. And it was my job on the road. Must have been uh, one hell of an experience. Voiceovers definitely sound interesting. It was fun. It was it was really a lot of fun. I, it finally, I did it until 2010. And then I was really touring heavily then. And they said, listen, yeah. you can either stay in New York City and take this full-time job yeah. or you have to leave it behind and give it to someone else. And 
I was on the road in Italy at the time when they gave me the choice. And I was like, I'm not going to give up music or voiceovers. So. <laughs> well, you, you took a wise decision. I hope so. I think so. <laughs> <laughs> uh, let's talk about borrowed time. What, what was the structural approach you took uh, in terms of ma- crafting the tracks on this particular album? This album was a whirlwind because we were initially, you know, I, I did it with Roof Records, which was my first label. Um, uh-huh. And then we gone on our own for a while. And then we went back to Roof Records yeah. for this yeah. album. Yeah. We initially had a well-known producer uh-huh. um, lined up. That producer was older and still concerned about COVID. Yeah. So we, you know, my guitarist and I, John Diamond, we were, we just had made all the demos. We were writing every day, but very quickly. I mean, we wrote the album in about six weeks. Mm. Um, we wrote the songs at his house every day, just showing up. And we wrote the songs, recorded them, just voice and acoustic in the studio. Yeah. And then we didn't have a producer anymore. So then at the last minute, our label gave us two guys to talk to. We sent the demos to both of them and we had a conversation with the one guy and he said everything that I had already been thinking, like borrowed time should be the title track. This is where you want to go with this song. I see hard road, a little more stonesy. And I was like, this is the guy. And it was so last minute. Then we flew to Detroit on Thanksgiving weekend um, and made the album outside of Michigan in eight days. I had wow. never spent, I had never done an album that fast in my life. Mm. And it was so much fun to just have somebody else deal with the scheduling of the band, paying the musicians and just showing up and singing. And some of the tracks, I was rewriting the lyrics while I was singing. them. I was on my keyboard, just typing and typing and typing, rewriting lyrics. But we did it. And I was happy with it. I really, I was like, this is either going to be a big piece of garbage or I'm going <laughs> to like it. <laughs> Since we are on the topic of borrowed time, I'd like to play a sneak peek of the song for the Indian audiences. Okay. I'm gonna wave my banner when you come to town. I won't ask you why you ain't been around. Don't even know it really matters now if we're hanging on borrowed time. You search for sages, never worth their a sneak peek of Borrowed Time by the one and only Dana Fuchs. Such an incredible track. Uh, is that is that Kevin uh, on, on the bass? No, that's um, a guy who has done all my albums, Jack okay. Daly. Okay. Who is a friend of Kevin's and Kevin's sort of a student of him or was, but Kevin is oh, now wow. my live guy. So Lovely, lovely. Can't, can't wait to see you all live. I just can't wait. Thank I'm just you. Count, counting uh, the number of days uh, to the festival. Yeah. Same. I'm very excited too. So thank you for saying that. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. So you've you've quoted that we are all on this planet together 
after all we are living on borrowed time so could you could you elaborate on that thought sure i it's sort of that's the theme of the whole album like yeah, you know yeah. what the hell are we doing wasting time fighting and worrying we we got such a limited amount of time on this one little life yeah uh, we're all on borrowed time and i you know in 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 buddhist uh philosophy we say when you're having a fight with someone you love you mm-hmm. can stop and think how am i sure i'm not going to die today am i sure they're not going to die today how am i going to feel is this fight worth it right yeah. you know yeah so that's sort of the, the theme of the whole album like what are we, what are we doing in fact initially there was supposed to be a train photoshopped behind me on that back shot where i'm in front of the tracks but the label thought that was too uh too intense mm-hmm. but uh you know i i think it's great like right from the production work to the musicians it's a lot of attention to detail that's gone behind this incredible album thank you oh i'll i'll have to tell the team you said yeah, that you should it. you should you should uh, so in terms of uh, the whole situation of the russian invasion of ukraine what are your thoughts it's the same thing it's just wow you know it, here is a a, a leader of who in this one small life how much do you need yeah. why more power why do you need more why do we have to take 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 again you know i have to always go back to the buddhist philosophy of everybody's happiness is equally as important to them as mine is to me and it, and if we just understood that like these people want to be they want to have you know a peaceful life they want their family to be safe they want to have good conditions just like you do why do why do we need to make people suffer to take more and more and more what are we doing with that extra power that extra land that extra, it, it just it doesn't make any sense to me it never has i think it doesn't make sense it's an absurdity in general i think war is really well uh you know you've come a long way you've had so many life experiences you've put out so many different albums so what's next for you what's what's next in the line for you mm you know i'm already thinking about my next album i you know i really i yeah. w- i want to make a little bit of a statement with it i haven't really done a blues album and i i'm always you know told i'm not blues enough i'm too rock and roll you know so i thought maybe i should just write like my version of a blues album not sure. try to yeah. be traditional blues yeah but really stick with something because you know the lyrics of a blues song are just what are they what's the famous expression the blues ain't nothing but a good man feeling bad right so yeah. we all have those days of good man woman whatever uh feeling bad so you know put it really in a into the kind of blues structure that i gravitated towards which is that real raw gut bucket so i'm i'm kind of leaning towards doing that and and just having it really about the vocal and the heft and the weight of that gut bucket blues style and 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 when are you likely to put it out it's a good question um i think we'll we'll start writing i i I've, i've been in graduate school funny enough i uh went back to get a masters degree and i've learned so much can't wait to graduate this spring honestly um and then that's the next step is to just write the album probably over the summer and talk about recording we tend to record around the holiday period because it's just easier there's no yeah nobody's working so we're not missing any work to do it so i would love to be able to be in the studio like thanksgiving christmas again it's always my favorite time to record and i and that's when i've done most of my albums we could we could think of an album premiere on the podcast once it's out Oh, I would love that. Thank you, Nidia. I'll I'll be sure to tell Kevin. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> you did you did mention that you're graduating. What are you studying right now? I'm getting a master's in educational theater, working oh. with kids. I started hmm. during the pandemic, I started running a little home school okay. pod for okay. my son and kids, but it's okay. bringing in music and dramatic concept uh just across like and it's specifically in my Harlem neighborhood taking kids whose parents can't afford to send them to summer camp and just working with them on music and drama and expression and creativity 
Um, so I just thought, well, let me learn. Actually, that's where you learn a skill. And it's like my passion's yeah. already there and I'm already creating it. Now I want to get the technique down a little better. So I decided I got a scholarship for this master's program because I'm helping kids in the community. Mm -hmm. And it's been wonderful. Well, can't wait to see the next generation of kids uh, straight out of Harlem. Yes, the Harlem <laughs> life. I know. I, I tell them that all the time. I'm like, you guys yeah, can do it. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> So I'd like to come to the last part of our agenda today, which is a rapid fire with Dana Fuchs. Shall we get started with that? What is that? It's, it's a rapid fire round uh, where I have some very uh, light uh, and uh, interesting questions. So, okay. Yeah. But first question for you. What is that one song that always makes you cry? Goodbye, Yellow Bear Road or Hey Jude. Okay. Spot <laughs> on. Uh, on the contrary, what's your favorite guilty pleasure song? Oh, um, another one bites the dust. Okay. Uh, what are the what are the top five things that uh, Indian fans can expect at a Dana Fuchs set at the Mahindra Blues Festival? Uh, hopefully, a lot of energy, passion, a, a a real desire to connect and make you. Just move, cry, dance, laugh, sweat. That's what I want. <laughs> Good book. Uh, what's your favorite cuisine? Oh, lately it's been lemon pasta that only Kevin can make. <laughs> oh, really? Okay, I've I've never tasted one. It's so good. It's really good. It's okay. pasta, but it's made with fresh lemon mm. and other things, but. Post the Mahindra Blues, what are what are probably the top three things you want to take back uh, after your journey in this country? Hmm. You know, I took so much back with me last time. Just, you know, even more of a deeper understanding of, of the culture and the people. Like, I went in in a haze the first time. And, um, you know, I was just, you know... I don't know. I, I I felt like still live. I hadn't quite found my own footing as much as I have now. Yeah. So I just want to be rid of any inhibition and and just give that to the people and hopefully take their some of theirs back with me. Well, I hope uh, you find what you're looking for. Thank you. I did. Yeah. Uh, if you had to describe your experience being on this interview, how would you describe it? It was wonderful. It was so much fun. I, I mean, I hope I didn't talk too much, but your questions were so great that I just felt like I, I could talk to you for hours. <laughs> it means a lot. It really means a lot coming from you. Uh, coming to my last question for today, uh, which is a custom in all of my interviews, and I ask all of my guests this very question. Down in the distant horizon, what would you like to be remembered as? Hmm. Just the person who cared about other people. And made them feel good. Great. Great answer for a closure. This interview will be additionally aired on Big FM Shillong and Aizol, two incredible radio stations in the northeastern part of India. And it'll also be out on my YouTube channel at, at the rate Aditya Veera1994. And it'll also be out on every possible audio streaming platform, ranging from Spotify to Apple Podcasts. And it is a one-of-a-kind uh, uh, first time uh, festival edition podcast featuring all you incredible women uh, playing at the Mahindra Blues Festival. So thank you so much for uh, participating. It's been such an incredible blessing, honor and a privilege. Thank you so much, Tina. Thank you, Aditya. Thank you so much for this support, encouragement and...